And what we're going to look at in this episode is the Staghound. It's unusual because it's an American designed armoured car. America wasn't renowned for building armoured cars at all, but it was used almost exclusively by the British and the British Empire. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. So this is the Staghound. It's a, a big armoured car, as you can see. It's fitted with a turret with a 37mm gun and a coaxial Browning 30 calibre. And it would normally have another 30 calibre in the front of the hull um, aimed and fired by the guy sitting next to the driver. It's a five-man vehicle. That's two in the front, a driver and his assistant who fires the machine gun, and three in the turret. It was actually built, it's quite interesting, the Americans hadn't any enthusiasm for armoured cars at all. But when they read about the British use of armoured cars in the desert, they began to think that it was probably as good a place as any for them to introduce armoured cars. And this was built originally with the intention of giving it to the British under the Lend-Lease Agreement and for the Americans to use it as well. The Americans in the end decided not to. In fact, they decided to cancel the whole thing. But the British quite liked the design of the Staghound and they ordered it and it meant that quite a few were built, a thousand or more, were built for British use only. And the Americans had nothing to do with it at all after that. They tested them. If it had been put into American service, it would have been given the designation M6. But it never was, so it was always known as the T17E1. Now it's powered by a pair of Chevrolet six-cylinder engines in the back. Each engine drives through a hydromatic gearbox, which is to say an automatic gearbox in a way, capable of giving four forward and one reverse speed. And it was linked to a um, hydraulic thing that brought the, the two power units together. So you had this, each engine developing about 97 horsepower, and both working together to drive the vehicle. It had a top speed of about 55 miles an hour, which was quite fast enough. The only trouble with it was that from the British point of view, it was quite big. It towered over a small vehicle like the Daimler armoured car, which was much more popular with the British Army. And this thing would have been ideal in the desert, but it actually was produced too late. In Normandy, in France and in Italy, it was really too large and too heavy. It weighs about 13 tonnes and was pretty well ignored from that point of view. The British used them more as command vehicles than as a regular troop of armoured cars. They were also issued to the Canadians, South Africans and the Australians in due course. And uh, they were automatic, as I say, so the driver had a pretty easy job. They were also power assist, had power-assisted steering, which meant that the driver could handle the thing easily, and that counts for quite a bit. But it was the size that put people off. It, it rather like the British AEC, it tended to tower above the hedges and get clobbered for that reason. The structure is mainly, the hull at least, is mainly of welded construction, with odd castings in, one thing they did have was stowage for two auxiliary fuel tanks, one on either side, each one capable of containing about 38 gallons of petrol. And they were fitted to both sides of one of these vehicles to give them a longer range. Um, it's, it's otherwise quite a good vehicle. Armour thickness, oh, about 30 millimetres at the most a little bit thicker on the turret, as you'd expect, but not that much because it's an armoured car. It's meant to be fairly light and fast rather than a, as a tank to slog it out. So from that point of view, it, it's fairly straightforward. 
The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. Now there were other versions of this. The British insisted on an anti-aircraft version. They supplied their own version of the turret, which was by Fraser Nash, which was electrically operated and mounted twin Browning machine guns. Now, that particular version, the Staghound anti-aircraft vehicle, had a three-man crew. It had a smaller turret than the normal Staghound turret, so the rest of the turret ring had to be filled in before that one was mounted. And it had no machine gun at the front. In fact, uh, I've, I'm against anti-aircraft vehicles at the best of times. I think they're a complete waste of time, but there we are. Everyone wants them. Of course, when they needed them in Normandy, they didn't really find any use for them because we'd nearly driven the Luftwaffe from the sky and there was nothing else to shoot at. So most of those AA vehicles we used as liaison vehicles not really as fighting vehicles at all. There was a version also with a 75mm close support howitzer in an open top turret, but that was not developed. It wasn't built in large enough numbers, so they decided to cancel it. Instead, the British operated um, ordinary stack ones, but with the three inch howitzer, replacing the 37mm in the turret. And the three-inch howitzer was a good close support weapon. There is a well-known photograph of the 27th Lancers, where, where you can actually see these vehicles in the lineup, and they're quite interesting. They're the ordinary vehicle, but with a, a different gun fitted, and you can see that at once. So that's the basic vehicle. It's entry on both sides. You can see you've got large doors and four-wheel drive, of course. The um, transfer box having two speeds meant that it actually, this thing actually had eight speeds forward and two in reverse. That's arranged through the transfer box. Makes it a bit more mobile. After the war, they tended to gradually trickle down. I think they were given to some of the countries in Europe and then they gradually trickled down until places like the Lebanon got them. And they have other turrets fitted to them. They have turrets from AEC armoured cars. They're quite interesting, just showing another version. There was a version of this, developed as the, known as the Stagkow Mark III, which had a Crusader turret, or modified slightly, mounting a 75 millimetre gun, which is more than you actually mounted in the tank. But that's quite an interesting vehicle. That was used mainly after the war by, by the Danish army, the Canadian army, who had a few of them, but they, they were fairly limited numbers built. They didn't have the extra fuel tanks at the side. They had stowage boxes instead, but otherwise were basically staghounds underneath. They were known as the Staghound Mark III. If you ever see one, they're quite rare. There's about two, I think, in preservation now. Um, but that's it. That's the vehicle. Weighs about 14, 13, 14 tonnes. You always got to juggle between the British ton and the American ton, which is just a, done to confuse you, really. But that's it. That's the vehicle known as the Staghound, only used by Britain and the British Empire at the time.